Hello and welcome to a special bye week edition of Rams Revealed. I'm your host, JB Long. Los Angeles is five and three at the midway point. Open date this weekend, as you know, followed by a challenging second half schedule featuring five division games. Here to give us a state of the franchise, if you will, is the executive VP and COO of the Los Angeles Rams, Kevin Demoff. And we're going to cover everything from salary cap to SoFi Stadium, from COVID to community impact, and of course, uniforms. Kevin, welcome. How are you doing? I'm good. It's uh, good to be on a bye week. Uh, you always look forward to these. We're fortunate, you know, to have it fall week nine without an international game. The past few years, we've had to be in the middle of the season because of a London game. But to be fortunate enough to have a, a week nine bye right smack in the middle to prepare for, you know, it should be a very exciting second half of the season is nice. You, you wish you could come in with a win, but at the same time, you know, it, it's good to get a little bit of a break away and prepare for what's going to be hopefully a good couple of months of Rams football. So we've all had a few days to put Miami in the rearview mirror. How does five and three feel atop the organization? You know, I think five and three is okay. Um, obviously, when you know that you had the chance to walk into the bye week at six and two, five and three doesn't seem great. But, you know, I think what's most important, aside from the record, is you know how we've played over the course of the year, you know, how the remaining schedule lays out, some of the challenges we face, some of the advantages we've had. Uh, to date and you know where we stand as a football team you know moving forward the most important thing I always think in the NFL through the first month of the season too is can you put yourself in position to make a meaningful playoff push if you're playing your best football at the end of the year and I, I think we're absolutely in that position you know I we always laugh right nobody controls their own destiny that's why it's destiny you don't control your own fate uh, but certainly you know the remainder of the season if we play up to the, our level of abilities uh, should hope to see us playing in, in January. And I think that's what's most important when you head into the midseason bye. All right. So from a team standpoint, let's start with the man at the top. In what ways have you seen Sean McVay evolve since last season? Where might he still be improving as a fourth year head coach? Well, I, I think the great thing that you see, you know, this is our fourth straight year that we've got in the midpoint with a winning record under Sean, right? So, I mean, I think that's, you never take that for granted, you know, in the NFL and, and continued success, uh, I think what you've seen this year in evolution of Sean is really, you know, a probably the most balanced team we've had in, in Sean's four years. Uh, obviously, I, I just watching his, you know, I don't want to say maturity because that's not the right word, but you can see his growth, uh, how he handles game day, you know, the day to day, how he's handled the pandemic and all the changes that have come, you know, throughout this year have just been so impressive, you know, with the team, with the players. You know, I think we forget because we have some familiar faces. We're the third youngest team, you know, the NFL and seeing some of that growth. We've been fortunate not to have, you know, maybe some of the injury plagues that other teams have had, but we've still had some guys move around, you know, losing Jordan Fuller, losing Joe Nopum, seeing guys step in, you know, seeing that evolution. But you know, I just think when you, when you look at Sean, when you see the way this team plays, you know, week in and week out, all the games are close. Uh, it's a great tribute to him, to the coaching staff, to the players. And, you know, when you look at, you know, where he ranks, I think, through you know, the first 50 games, you know, really up there with only, I think it's John Madden, Vince Lombardi, and George Allen. That's great company. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's been just, it's fantastic to have him at the head of our program, leading our charge, and, you know, wouldn't want it any other way. Yeah, I think knowing him as you do, you've shared maybe this thought or this concern at various junctures that he cares so much and works so hard that the only thing that's going to stop him professionally is burnout. It is just going too hard and burning it from both ends. It seems to me that he was conscientious about that this offseason and has kind of revised his personal approach and his personal enjoyment and appreciation for every week and every relationship and every win along the way. Do you expect that? to pay dividends this season and for many years to come. Yeah, I think, you know, it'll be interesting seeing coming off of the bye. He seems fresher, you know, than at any other point. Obviously the pandemic, you know, in that regard was a little bit different when you don't have an off season program and kind of a short in training camp. But I do think you hear it in his conversations with you each week. We hear it in his press conferences, you know, trying to enjoy the wins, even, you know, what you might call an ugly win. I don't know if there is such a thing, you know, in the NFL, uh, you know, and, and great perspective. Uh, I think he's really enjoying this coaching staff and this team. Uh, and that has been fun. And, and I, truly, I think, you know, one of the things that's been great for this team this year is, you know, certainly 
you know, 2017 was such an enjoyable year for the franchise because you had no expectations. You came out of nowhere and you played great. 2018, we went in with Super Bowl expectations kind of nationally, you know, internally, you know, and you played with that, you played great all year, but you played with the weight of those expectations, you know, all season, you know, and then in 2018, you had the fires mid season, you had the Mexico city, you know, 2019, you're trying to bounce back from a Super Bowl loss and you're playing with those expectations the whole year. I think this year has had much more of a 2017 feel to everybody in the organization where, you know, whether right or wrong, the expectations nationally were a little bit lower for us this year. I think some of us took, you know, offense to being written off before the season started and we'll see how it finishes. But I think with that's come a greater enjoyment perspective and a little bit more freedom throughout the organization where everybody you know, just goes week to week, enjoys being together, enjoys the chance to play. And I think there's one thing in 2020 that you never take for granted is being together, getting to play football, getting to perform for fans and, and bring that joy to people for three hours on Sunday. Kevin, would it be an overstatement to say that Jared Goff is entering a defining stage of his career in the back half of this schedule? I think that's an overstatement. I mean, I, look, I think quarterbacks are in a defining stage of their career every week, every couple of weeks as you get into it in, in this season. I, I think, you know, the difference, you know, people always want to pin the highs and lows of a season, you know, on a quarterback. And I think Jared is so unfairly, you know, evaluated game to game, week to week. You know, you have good games where you put up great numbers, you don't turn the ball over, and people are disappointed that we didn't throw it deep, you know, and that we didn't do those things. And then you maybe, you know, you win a game, you, know, you lose a game in Buffalo where he plays great and brings us back. You know, I just – the quarterback is always such a flashpoint for, for any team. Uh, you see it throughout the NFL and, you know, and I also think we're spoiled in this day when you see the great play, you know, day in and day out of Patrick Mahomes, the Russell Wilsons, people want all, every team's quarterback to play, you know, at that level. We're so fortunate to have Jared, to have the stability he brings, the talent, you know, he's had a great start to the season. Sure. He's had a couple of probably uneven performances that he would want better. I think that's true for probably every player in our roster through, you know, eight games. But I think if you also look at, you know, one of the things for Jared, some of the teams we, you know, historically he's played very well against Seattle. He's played very well, you know, against Arizona. You know, you get to some of the division, you know, games. I think one of the very interesting things for our team, because we haven't played many division games, so many of these teams are new, you know, yeah. that we haven't seen, you know, you haven't seen their defenses, you haven't seen their personnel. You know, I think one of the great things about the second half of the schedule is these are teams we know very well. Um, we know their coaching staffs, we know their philosophies. And, you know, that really allows us to go in and probably play looser and play freer rather than seeing a new challenge each week. I remember writing preseason, Kevin, that the pieces were at least in place for Brandon Staley to have a really impressive debut season and potentially even be one and done in Los Angeles in the best case scenario. Um, this is kind of a double-edged sword because I'm worried that best case scenario may be playing out in front of our very eyes here in 2020. Would it be wrong to expect him to be interviewing for head coaching jobs this winter? Look, I think you want all of your coaches to be desired and wanted. I think for any position in the organization, the more people want your coaches, your personnel people, your staff on you know, the business side, the better you are as an organization. Right? I mean, that, that is truly a, a great sign of respect for what Sean has built, for what Les has done, hopefully for the organization. You want people to circle that in and put a target on it. And I think – you know, what would be so interesting is, you know, a defensive person that Sean brought in. Obviously, there's been so much talked about a Sean McVay tree. Um, you know, and you look at Zach Taylor, you look at Matt LaFleur, you look at kind of, you know, the revolution that, you know, the offensive young coach, you know, the hiring of Sean started. It hasn't necessarily translated to the defensive side of the ball for, for Sean's coaches. Obviously, you know, you saw, you're seeing more, more young coaches get a chance everywhere, which I think is great. Um, I think it would be fantastic if Brandon got opportunities in the off season. It's something you would relish. It would mean things went, you know, wonderfully right for us probably as a franchise and you'd be happy, you know, for him. You'd also be perfectly happy if people stayed far, far away, you know, for, for a little bit, but I give Brandon a ton of credit, you know, a lot of young pieces, you know, on defense, a lot of new faces working in a new scheme, you know, really getting that production. You know, I, I think certainly the statistics would bear out that you know, we played probably, you know, I think 
if you look at the first half of the season, we played some tremendously strong defenses and maybe some offenses that are on the lower spectrum. You know, we have great challenges coming up. You know, when you look at Seattle, Arizona, Tampa, some of those offenses we have coming back, obviously San Francisco coming back to SoFi Stadium, you know, so, you know, similar to everything else in our team, if we're talking about Brandon Staley and, you know, any other coaches and, and they all deserve it. I think if you look at the work, you know, Chris Shula has done, Eric Henderson, you know, has done Aubrey and, you know, Ajiro, you know, when you look at the de- development of a, a Jordan Fuller on the back end, when you look at Joe Barry and the inside linebackers with Micah Kaiserson, I mean, I think the entire defensive staff has done a really nice job developing some of those players. And that credit goes to Brandon. I also give, you know, Sean a ton of credit for going out and, you know, really looking for new blood um, on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, in that coaching search and trying to find, you know, someone who would bring a different edge to our defense. You know, Wade Phillips had such success, you know, with us, three winning seasons, a Super Bowl run, two division titles. You know, it's really hard to replace an amazing person like Wade Phillips. And I think Brandon has come in and not tried to be Wade Phillips, not try to be anything but himself, and we're a better franchise for it. Your point's well taken, though. There's a little bit of a resume difference between Tua and Tom Brady, though. Can't wait to see uh, Staley and company test their mettle against the second half of this schedule. Still to come in this conversation with Kevin Demoff, salary cap, sole pants, uh, whether fans will see SoFi Stadium this year. But it's not just our bye week, it's also election week. And I do want to take a moment, Kevin, to highlight how the organization played a role in that process this election season and really has taken its community impact to a whole new level here in 2020. We could spend a whole podcast on this topic, whether it's, you know, Jared's involvement and commitment to the Englewood school district to Jalen Ramsey's million dollar pledge in Nashville. What's that all been like for you to take it all in? Well, I think one of the great things this year from an organizational perspective is, you know, maybe that additional time in the off season where players were at home when they were, you know, starting to to spend more time talking to their teammates, looking at social justice initiatives, how they can get involved, is I think our players really came in with a plan for 2020 on what they wanted to do. And, you know, you see it with Jared getting involved with Inglewood Unified, his donation to Warren Lane, you know, elementary school, everything he's doing there, which also allowed us to partner him up with a SoFi to distribute 20,000 backpacks, you know, to kick off the school year at Inglewood Unified. You see a Sebastian Joseph Day you know, handing out meals to frontline workers at Cedar sinai then getting involved, trying to conquer the digital divide that has become, you know, so increasingly important here in a COVID uh, virtual learning area. You see Andrew Whitworth double down with his commitment, you know, to underprivileged kids and looking to build STEAM programs. You see Jalen Ramsey and what he's done in Nashville. I've seen such engagement and excitement, you know, from our players. You see, you know, Johnny Hecker and Michael Brockers, leading the Players Social Justice Fund and trying to figure out how they can do grants, you know, to all kinds of different community initiatives. Their effort, their participation, their leadership has really helped set the way for the organization, you know, in this time. And it's so hard because as, as you know, JB, what we do as an organization is we go out to nonprofits, we go out in the community, we make a difference, we roll up our sleeves and we're there face to face, you know, side by side with so many of our community partners. We can't do that you know, this year. And it is internally frustrating for all of us when you see something like United Way Home Walk, which is next Saturday, go virtual. But at the same time, it has given so many of our players an opportunity to really reprioritize how they can make a difference, you know, what's important to them. And if nothing else, you know, good comes out of 2020, they're, that silver lining of them finding their voice, finding their leadership and taking that forward you know, once we are able to get back into the community is going to be a great thing for, for not only for the ramp, but for all of Los Angeles. You're now a year removed from trading for Jalen Ramsey and having made him the highest paid player at his position subsequently. How does Rams management feel about the return on that deal so far and moving forward? You know, it was interesting when you look back a year ago, you know, when you traded for Jalen and, you know, taking – you know, that chance, you know, we had done a lot of trades, you know, Les and, and his team and Sean, you know, that had been aggressive, but Jalen was the most aggressive move that they had made two number one picks and, you know, trying to understand what, what could happen there. And, you know, I think, you know, one of the great things about Jalen has been, you know, you see players who rise to the occasion, who are those emotional leader. And one of the things Jalen's an amazing talent, but he brings, 
an energy of feistiness to our team that I just don't know that we had previously. Um, and that's not a knock on any of our players and how they lead. We have amazing players. They all lead in different ways. And I think on defense, you know, really that spark plug, that energy generous or bunny. And I think Jalen, you know, he, this isn't a perfect comparison. He's got a lot of Robert Woods of the defense to him. He'll do the dirty work. He'll make the tackles. He'll make the plays. It doesn't always show up in the stat sheet. I know people say, oh, well, it's a corner. He should have interceptions. But I think if you look back to all of our games, he has made a play that has probably changed the course of the game physically. And a lot of them have been tackled. You know, when you think about, you know, that hit uh, against the Cowboys, you know, they, you know, broke up a pass, you know, on third down that forced them to punt that allowed us to kind of run out the clock. You think about the Giants game, you know, that hit on Golden Tate. The Redskins game, knocking Kyle Allen out, you know, of the game and the league wisely not finding him for what clearly was a mistaken call, I think, in our opinion, on the helmet to helmet. You know, when you look through all of those victories, the Bears game, you know, coming up with a meaningful interception, but more importantly, the third down stop, you know, that they wind up challenging in their own you know, end zone that forces a punt. You know, he brings that physical presence, that energy. You know, I think the match of him and Brandon Staley, you know, moving him around the defense, seeing him blitz, you know, seeing him play the nickel, seeing him play outside. It's not just, you know, I think so many people, when you talk about a shutdown corner, think about, you know, Revis Island, or I'm just going to match a guy up and take the best player out of that. And we haven't done that. You've seen a mix of, I think, what the Patriots have historically done, which is maybe Jalen's on the number two receiver one-on-one -on -one and you double you know, the number one receiver, you know, that's a Bill Belichick trait. You've seen him play all over the place. You've seen him blitz. You know, he plays, you know, with such energy and such fights. And I think when you start a defense, you know, with Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey as your building blocks, it allows you to do so many other things. And look, and I think one of the great things, you know, you've seen is Troy Hill and Darius Williams have shown themselves that people are going to test them. They're going to make great plays. I mean, you look at Troy Hill breaking up a great ball, you know, against the Bears, causing an interception. Darius Williams has gotten his hands on key plays, Giants, Eagles, you know, other games. You know, people have learned that the secondary isn't Jalen Ramsey and a bunch of no-names. It's a really talented group that complements, you know, each other very well. And in Wall, you know, we were thrilled to be able to extend Jalen to see what he could do, you know, to lock that piece in and to make him a cornerstone. And I think one of the things Les always says, when you can go acquire difference makers and cornerstones, who are young and have them make a difference, you do so. And I, you know, even this trade deadline, you know, we were looking for, are there the Jalen Ramseys, you know, out there? Sometimes you have to remind Les that you don't have a first round pick next year. <laughs> you don't necessarily have, you know, Les, Tony will tell you, Les will trade picks all the time. We don't have, um, you know, which was a, you know, hallmark of a, a great GM being aggressive. But, you know, I, I think, you know, a year later, you look the way Jalen has led our team in the community, the spark plug he's brought, you know, to our team on the field and off the field ha has been great. And, you know, to see him embrace Los Angeles in his new home has been fantastic. Without the benefit of a full salary cap 101 tutorial, is there a simple way to explain how you did the extensions for Jalen, for Cup, for Woods this summer? Yeah, I, look, I, I think they're, you know, this year – you know, really as a, as a group, when we sat down and looked at where we were with the salary cap going into 2020, you know, looking into the pandemic and what might happen, you know, we made, you know, two difficult decisions. One was to, you know, release Todd Gurley, um, you know, who had been such a stalwart for us in Los Angeles, such an amazing player, you know, since being drafted. And then to trade Brandon Cooks <clears throat> for, for what ultimately turned out to be Van Jefferson. And, you know, when you look at that, you know, those two deals basically freed up $29 million a year moving forward. I, actually, it's a little bit less than that, probably about $27 million a year forward for our team. Um, now, there was significant pain in 2020. You have taken a massive dead money hit on, on Brandon Cooks. Um, you take a, a pretty significant one on Todd Gurley that's, you know, rolls over a little bit to next year. But those deals come off the books moving forward. And it's really that money that you then turn around and say, okay, that goes to a Cooper cup that went to a Jalen Ramsey. Those two deals come off. That's 27 million. 
you know, you removed a Dante Fowler, you, know, you don't re-sign Dante. You know, that was a $12 million deal. You know, you pass on, you know, a Corey Littleton, you know, some of those extensions, and you really refunneled that into, you know, into our own team. So, you know, while it was a little bit tighter this year, you, know, you had some of that space you created moving forward for us and locking those pieces in. Um, and I think that was really, you know, the map. This year was tight. You know, but Jalen went in with a $13 million salary this year. Um, you know, he got a $25 million signing bonus, but ultimately, you know, a million dollar salary. So the way, you know, he, we got $8 million in savings for Jalen this year. That money's really still there. We haven't spent that. That'll probably roll over to next year, mm -hmm. um, you know, at this point. So, you know, that'll give us a little bit of a cushion, you know, there. But I, I think what you're going to have is, you know, when you look at our team, you know, with a Jared, a Jalen, an Aaron Donald, a Cooper Cup, you know, a Robert Woods, a Rob Havenstein, Tyler Higby, you know, those guys all kind of locked in moving forward, plus, you know, our younger team, you know, that's the core of your roster. And look, when you pay some upper echelon guys, you're going to have to find places you save for the points. It's one of the reasons we're the third youngest team you know, in the league right now. But I think one of the great, you know, this is a great credit to Les. You know, what people don't realize about our team this year is I think we have 14, it's either 14 or 16 second or third round picks in our roster from 2017 to 2020, mm -hmm. right? So you go trade for an Austin Corbett who's got three years left on a rookie contract. You know, you go get a Ja'Kai Polite who was a third round pick, you know, who's got three more years left on a rookie contract. Even some of those in addition to all the second and third rounders you know, that we've acquired. And while we haven't had first rounders the past few years, we've steadily had four second and third rounders, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. That's the bulk of our roster right now, which allows you to spend a little bit more. Now you got to hit on those guys. You have to hit on the Jordan Fullers. But then when you see a Darius Williams and Troy Hill locking down, you know, those corner positions, you know, they were both waiver claims. I mean, I think that's, you know, great when you see Austin Blythe playing for us as a waiver claim. Austin Corbett, you know, a trade for a fifth rounder in 2021. You know, those are the pieces of your roster that really make it come together. When you look at, you know, contributors, Johnny Munt's an undrafted player. You know, that really is how it all balances out, and it's going to be how it has to balance out for us in the future. But even, you know, if you look ahead to 2022, yes, we don't have – sorry, 2021. We don't have a first-round pick. We have a second round pick. We have a third round pick. We expect to get, you know, two compensatory picks for Corey Littleton and Dante Fowler. Those should be somewhere in the third or fourth round. So all of a sudden, once again, you'll have a second rounder. You should have two third rounders, maybe a fourth, right back to that formula of multiple day two picks and early day three picks to help fill out that middle part of your roster. So I guess the takeaway for fans internally and externally who question like, well, what are the Rams feeling in terms of a tightening of the belt? There doesn't seem to be any reason based on what you just said that fans can't expect a roster of this caliber or maybe even better moving forward. No, well, look, I, you know, this was always, there was always going to be one year where you need to take a little bit of pain. Yeah. Um, for us, that was in 2020, yeah. uh, you know, and it made some difficult decisions, you know, to lose some, really great players who helped us go to a Super Bowl, right? That is hard. And then even worse, you know, not be able to keep, you know, a Dante Fowler, a Corey Littleton, you know, a Greg Zerline, some of those names, you know, that's hard. Um, and I, you, you hate to see those players move on. You want to be able to keep everybody. But at the same time, you know, I think when you look at, you know, our team moving forward, you, know, you have Jared, you have your running backs, Cam Akers and Daryl Henderson, both on rookie deals, obviously Malcolm coming up. You know, Tyler Higby is going to be there. You know, Gerald Everett is a free agent. You know, but Johnny Munt and Bryson Hopkins are there. When you look at the receiving room, Josh Reynolds is a free agent next year. Van Jefferson, you know, is still on the roster, you know, as are Robert, you know, and Cooper. So I think when you look at the team, you know, we will have the ability each year to try to keep some of our own guys and, and be proactive. You know, obviously we have a couple of free agents coming up next year. You know, when you look at the John Johnsons and the Gerald Everett and the Josh Reynolds, and, you know, we probably won't be able to keep all of them, but hopefully we can keep some of them. Um, you know, who knows what next year looks like from a salary cap perspective in the NFL. You know, but our goal is, look, you have to do one 
couple of things. You have to try to keep as many players as you can. And the ones that they go, you have to turn those compensatory picks, you know, into something of value. Okay, five regular season home games at SoFi Stadium remaining in 2020 with record level COVID cases across the country, unfortunately, though not necessarily here in LA. What is the honest likelihood of playing in front of fans before the year is out? Yeah, well, look, I think we got some encouraging news a couple of weeks ago. You know, Governor Newsom established what it would, what, how we could have fans, right? 20% fans if we could get to the orange COVID level in LA County, 25% if we get to Yelp. Obviously, there's a long way to go before we can get to orange. I mean, we're still in purple, you know, trying to trend toward red. So, you know, if you're looking through a crystal ball, it's hard to say with cases rising across the country, you know, record numbers each day, you know, can we flatten the curve and go from purple to orange? Maybe, you know, I think it's one of those great things. We have four home games after Thanksgiving. So at least that gives us a shot, right. To get fans in. And maybe if you're fortunate enough to get into the playoffs and, and host a game, you could get there. And, you know, we're preparing each day, like we have a chance to get fans in, you know, through December, you know, if we can, we would love to do it. Um, and there are some fans, you know, those who have stuck with us, season ticket members who have said, hey, raise their hands and said, I'll come if you open the building. We can't wait to do that. And we were fortunate enough enough last week, you know, we were able to open up the building, you know, the team store to fans, season ticket members who could come in and, you know, go to the team store and be able to peek through, you know, see the stadium. We're hopeful to do that again, you know, next week ahead of the Seahawks game. You know, if we, we got that permission from LA County Public Health. So we are doing everything we can. You know, I don't have a great crystal ball, but, you know, if we can get fans in there, we look forward to, you know, welcoming people to SoFi Stadium. If not, 2021, we'll be right there for them. Hmm. How's Dan Kroenke taking all of this, given the magnitude of the investment and unfortunately the delayed return on said investment? Well, look, I think you have to break it into two things. One is, you know, he built an amazing building transformed the NFL, transformed the Los Angeles landscape. You know, when you see SoFi Stadium as you have JB, I mean, just, it's an amazing jewel. We've been so fortunate to have the commissioner and so many NFL people come through. And, you know, one of my favorite things I see now is when visiting teams come in and they take their phones out to the field and kind of, you yeah. know, Instagram everything in the video moment. So I think there's a you know, tremendous pride, you know, from all of us for, you know, what Stan has done for the Rams, what he's done for the LA community, what he's done for the NFL. Sure, there's disappointment you know, and not being able to have fans and not having to be full, but that's temporary. I mean, when you look at what's going on in this country right now, you know, to push back fans and SoFi Stadium by a year, you know, if that's the biggest issue that, that we have to overcome as a franchise and organization, you know, that's great. And I think Stan has said it. He wants to welcome back fans when it's safe to do so. He'll be excited about that. But, you know, his focus is on making sure that first responders, healthcare workers, that we take care of them and that we're good stewards of our community and we don't push the envelope in a way that would be irresponsible. And that's been his you know, edict to all of us is put fans first, put healthcare workers first, put frontline workers first. And we're certainly following that. Yeah. You know, I've been describing it as looking forward to having the opportunity to watch your favorite movie or TV show with someone who hasn't. Like we've had the privilege of being in there. And the silver lining to me is that I think this experience is going to continue for a decade, if not a generation of every week, there'll be someone coming in for the first time and to see the joy and the awe in their eyes and in their hearts, I think will be hopefully the reward for, for this price that we've paid in the short term. Yeah. And look, we get a lot of, we get, get a lot of dress rehearsals, right? I mean, so by the yeah. time fans are in there, you know, you know, we were ready for prime time. We thought, you know, September 13th against the Cowboys, but by the time fans are open there, we get better every time we learn the building, every time we go in and we play a game, we put on a show, you know, we all learn it a little bit better and that will re result in a better fan experience. I'm sure you know, when the building opens. As construction continues in Inglewood, Kevin, the Rams are in year five back in LA and still operating out of a temporary facility at Cal Lutheran and Thousand Oaks. Is there any update on where the organization might put down more permanent routes? Do you ask that as an employee who wants to know where to go each day? Or do you ask that as, you know, a, a hard hitting journalist who wants to know? I, look, you know, when we moved back in 2016, I said, okay, by the end of 2016, you know, we'll have an idea of where the facility will be. And then certainly by 2017, and, you know, it has been the bane of our existence trying to figure out, you know, where you go build a facility. But, you know, Stan talks all the time about how fortunate we were to find 300 acres of land for a stadium in a sports entertainment district in, in Englewood. 
you know, trying to find 40 to 50 acres for a practice facility of, you know, undisturbed, entitled, you know, properly entitled land right now is not easy in Southern California. And then trying to factor in, you know, where's convenient for employees, where's the right place for the community and our fans and trying to balance all of that. You know, we continue to make some progress. You know, I, I certainly thought by the end of 2020, we'd be well under construction, but, you know, unfortunately that hasn't been the case. You know, fingers crossed, we've got, you know, a path on a few different options you know, that we're focused on. But I think the great thing is, you know, one of the great things about our setup at Cal Lutheran is because it is temporary, because it has so much space outdoors, the tent we were able to build for COVID, being able to take so many things outside has made it a really good COVID facility. Maybe in the way if we had built a new training facility, that wouldn't be. So, you know, that's something at least I smile about this year. And when I was in Tampa Bay, you know, we used to have the worst facility in the NFL it was trailers at the end of the runway at Tampa Airport. And they won a Super Bowl. They had a great run there. We moved into a new building, you know, in 2006, and I think went to the playoffs in 2007, not since then, right? So, you know, a facility is great, but it doesn't change the atmosphere. And, you know, the Les Snead says all the time, he'll miss Cal Lutheran when we leave here. It's a, it's a great place for our staff, our players. It's tucked away, the beautiful scenery, you know, but if we can get some of those more modern amenities, you know, for all of us, get the franchise back under one roof together, that'd be great. No, I always appreciate that it's never been an excuse for Sean McVay's Rams, who now have a chance to put together a fourth consecutive winning season and comparing it and contrasting it to the college environment that I operate in sometimes too. It's a distinct disadvantage, right? Okay. There's no getting around the fact that there are disadvantages to it. And yet here they are playing some of the greatest football in Rams franchise history. You know, you, you can talk about advantages, disadvantage, right? We're not college. We're not recruiting. We actually right. pay these players. So, <laughs> you know, much like you do at Notre Dame, right? So I, I would Bye. say – you know, just kidding. But, uh, you know, I, I think when you look at it overall, you know, the space at, at Cal Lutheran might be imperfect, but it's really well designed for players, right? I mean, we have a large training room, a large yep. weight room. It flows to the outdoor fields. You know, we redid the locker room this year, and the players are really enjoying that. The player spaces, you know, all work. Do they have the best bells and whistles and amenities? Maybe not. But in terms of functional space, uh, I think it works far better probably than many facilities in the NFL that were built before kind of the current wave of how you participate, you know, in the NFL, is it, you know, the new star or what Vegas has done or Minnesota? No, it's not one of the top five or 10, but it, it certainly works. And I think our players will tell you who have been other places. That it's a great building. It provides community players love gathering and, you know, they love the setting out here in the Conejo Valley. And so there are positives, you know, I'm sure there are drawbacks. I'm sure we'll spoke, speak glowingly, you know, of a new building, but it's no different to me than, you can never let it be an excuse. Just like the Coliseum, you know, yes, it's great to be in SoFi State and the Coliseum was great. We went to a Super Bowl. We won two division titles here at Cal Lutheran. So, you know, I know, you know, everybody can't wait to be in a new building, but this has certainly not been an impediment to success. No, I appreciate the point you made too. It's not like you can lift weights outside of Buffalo at Thanksgiving or hold your team meetings in Detroit in December uh, outdoors under a tent. So in this environment in particular, I think it's been integral to, kind of protecting that ecosystem through half a season. And that continues to be the case. And so Kevin, the last topic would of course be uniforms. We've saved the best for last per usual. And we want to welcome everyone who scrubbed through this conversation to find this specific portion. Welcome to Rams Revealed. Uh, you know, I observe more and more, this is anecdotal of course, but people are coming around to the look. I'm sure you've seen and heard some of that too. Uh, having now seen all the elements on game day, on TV, sunlight, prime time in SoFi Stadium. What's your update level of confidence that the Rams got this rebrand right? Look, I, the updated level of confidence is it's always in the fans' minds whether we got the rebrand right, right? It doesn't really matter what we all think. I think what has changed, you know, I will admit, launching a new brand, new colors, new logos, new uniforms in a pandemic is suboptimal. Right. And, you know, certainly at a time when we did the logo and the uniforms, everybody just wanted comfort and you're stuck in your house and everybody's online and, you know, a lot of angst. And, you know, look, it, it was a big change. Uh, we will certainly be the first to say that. But I think it's one designed to, you know, appeal to the next generation to grow a fan base. And certainly that comes with a lot of consternation from people who have been with us for 40, 50 years. And we get that. Uh, always knew that that would be the case. But I think the one thing with all uniforms, right? People are used to making, you know, your association comes from the memories of people making plays in them. 
right, and watching them. And so now when you see them on and you see players, you know, make great plays in them and diving interceptions, you have positive memories now associated with those uniforms. They go from just, you know, being a reveal in a, you know, Twitter video, you know, or an Instagram post to seeing them up close and live. You know, they were designed for the lights of SoFi, for sunlight. You see that all come together. Um, I think there have been a lot of people who have been, you know, pleasantly surprised when they see them on and say, okay, it starts to make sense. And there are going to be some people who aren't going to come around and look, I'll be the first to say, you always want everybody to say you nailed it right from the first time and to love all of them. And, and look, uniforms are very simple. If you want to get universal praise, just go back to something you've already had, right? I was online Monday night and everybody saying, oh, the Giants should have never left, you know, these uniforms that they wore 40 years ago, right? Everybody could go back to what they wore in the 70s and 80s. And I think the world would be universally happy. That's not necessarily the approach we took. Um, that would probably would have been the safer choice, but this has never been an organization that has played it safe in anything we've done. And coaching hires and building stadiums, you know, and uniforms are no exception. I, I think that's the ethos we have. And we're excited to continue to build the brand, the colors, the look, and to continue making plays. And I promise you, if Jared Goff throws a great ball to Cooper Cup to win the NFC West this year in any of the uniform combinations, people will have positive associations with that. I mean, the players love them. And to me, that's kind of exhilarating and gives me some juice when I show up at the stadium and see them bouncing around and see them talking to their peers and admiring the new look. Is Bone still their favorite, do you think, within the locker room? You know, Bone, Bone or, or Blue and Saul, you know, both, you know, obviously now that we've lost our first game and Blue and Saul, Bone may be, you know, but I know the players do think the Bone is something special, something unique, and, and they yeah. gravitated towards that look. So you know, that's fun to see. 0-2 in the monochrome royal blue look. They seem to be the least favorite among the audience. Will we see those pants again in 2020? Or are they going to be shelved as more of a once-per-year novelty? You know, that, that's a great question for Brandon Berger. You know, one of the issues we had, and I know people kept saying, you know, more saw pants, is those were the last things Nike delivered to us this year because of the pandemic. So we actually didn't really get them until the end of August. So when people said, why didn't you wear them during the scrimmage? Because we didn't have them. <laughs> and even at the beginning of the year, Brendan was very careful – because we only had so many, not to necessarily overuse them in games, because the quick turnaround meant that, you know, we might not have enough pairs for the next game. And, you know, now that we've got them more in, you know, but I certainly, after, uh, you know, after the second loss in, you know, the monochrome look in San Francisco, I looked at him and said, you know, all right, definitely yellow pants. We were always planning to go yellow pants against the Bears. And after we beat the Bears, I said, you're packing the yellow pants for, you know, for Miami. Um, you know, but now I, I'd probably look at him and say, let's go all bone all the time. But you have to submit the uniform conversation, you know, combination, at least the tops, to the NFL July 1st. Um, so that means we don't necessarily get to go in and change it, you know, up on the fly. But we have a couple of bone games left, some, some blue, and, you know, hopefully we can just play good football in all of it and win the remaining eight games and all the combinations, and that'll be great. So I think the blue is set for Seattle coming out of the bye in week 10, which means there should be plenty of time to launder them and get a new shipment in. Yep. And we'll, and we'll say, okay, we're blue, two and zero at home and you know, in the blue and yellow, but I, you know, one of the great things is we get to the second part of the season, right? We have been undefeated so far. Having five of those last eight games at home is going to be great to only leave the Western time zone once to go to Tampa is awesome. The last nine weeks of the season with the travel, you know, that we've had, I guess no offense to, to your wife, Arizona, I guess it's now Mountain Standard Time or <laughs> Pacific, whatever Arizona follows, you know, this time of year. Um, you know, but to not have any long plane plan fights except for Tampa will be a great benefit to this team. Finishing strong at home will be awesome, and, and we'll do it in the uniforms, we'll do it in the colors. And, you know, while there have been no fans at SoFi, it has provided a great home field advantage for us. Uh, last one on the uniform front, any timeline or plans for – version three upcoming in 2021 how would you like to see those rolled out you know i think we're, we're still talking to to nike and the nfl about version three version four you know the fact that we held back those two uniform combos you know for the future those will be something i think we'll look at after the season and and talk about but no real updates on those so far but you know plan to roll those out in the coming years um if we do one it would be one next year and maybe one the following year or some some combination thereof so you know, our goal, hopefully, is we can get to the point where maybe we can unveil a new uniform every year, you know, either the way we space it out or whether the NFL or Nike, you know, changes those rules, you know, 
maybe a little bit more of a European soccer model where you come up with that alternate jersey, you know, each year. Wow, the Oregon Ducks of Los Angeles. You know, I some people like that, some people don't. Um, but yeah, they you know, we could see that. Kevin, I appreciate you and your leadership and the time here on your bye week. Uh, thank you for joining Rams Revealed, and good luck in the second half of the season. I hope it's a very successful one. Well, hopefully it's a great run for our fans here in November, December, and hopefully in January. To everybody, you know, thank you for, for voting. We saw a great outreach, you know, when people coming to SoFi Stadium and doing that. We saw, you know, unbelievable participation online. Stay healthy. You know, the best way to get fans into SoFi Stadium is to wear a mask, socially distance do the things that help flatten this curve and hopefully we can get fans into SoFi. If not, we can't wait to see you in 2021 and hopefully with another playoff appearance in the NFC West division championship under our belt. Well summarized. All right, for Kevin, Jory, and Rudy, I'm JB Long. This has been another edition of Rams Reveal.